I'm Tim Ventura from AmericanAntigravity.com and I'm speaking today with Stan Dale on the subject of anti-gravity. To start right out, your bio describes your background as including some top secret work for Dr. Edward Teller on the development of flying saucer technology. I'm wondering if you could give us a little bit of background on the project itself as well as the technology that you were working on. All right, well, uh, I guess to back up, in 1970 and 71, I was in Dallas working for um, uh, a large conglomerate of companies, about 100 of them, and I was in the systems analysis department uh, managing the systems analysts. Uh, as a hobby, sort of, uh, at home and on the, the back of my blackboard in my office there, I was working on a way to control gravity, and um, I hit upon an aerodynamic thing for a craft to begin with, and then I graduated to uh, a plasma, uh, a spin plasma around a disc or saucer-shaped um, aircraft. Um, I didn't tell but one person anything about any of that um, uh, in the company or elsewhere because it was you know, my private research project, and I only spoke to this particular fellow in kind of abstract terms over a cup of coffee one morning guy I didn't know very well. Anyway, he was uh, head of one of our companies. Anyway, uh, he said to me that I should um, take my theories to a um, Dr. James R. Maxfield there in Dallas and uh, at the radiation research uh, lab down the street. And I said, oh, well, thanks very much. You know, well, I'll get around to it and forgot it for about a month. And I was down at that same uh, coffee shop at the bottom of the building where we service about 3,000 employees in the lunchroom. And I was the only one sitting there at the time because it was in between you know, scheduled meals. And this same company executive comes over and sits down in front of me and he says, hey, you haven't been to see my friend Dr. Maxwell yet? I said, oh, no, look, I've been busy and forgot about it, you know, and, you know, usual excuses. And he says, well, I've made an appointment for you at 3 o'clock this afternoon. I want you to go over and see him. He just do that. And he here. So I said, all right, uh, good, sure, right. So I got in the car and took off at 3 o'clock and went over there to see this guy's son. Research lab, and I pulled up in the parking lot there in Dallas, and there was no other cars but me there, and just this long building, uh, just average-looking building, in between some other buildings. So I walk up to the front door, and um, it was sort of ajar. So I pushed it open, and there was this long, dark, dark hallway stretching out in front of me, and maybe a little bit of ray of sunshine coming down from a window way down about halfway. No sounds of life inside at all, just you know, empty. And I thought, wow. Maybe I got the wrong address. I checked the address, right place. I found the name of the building there, you know, Maxwell Radiation Research Lab, and I thought, right. I walked down the hall very carefully and thought, well, you know, this is really weird. Uh, is somebody going to jump out and go boo or what? And uh, anyway, I got about halfway down to where that, that light was, and it was a nurse's reception station, you know, for people coming in for the radiation test or whatever they really did there. And this nurse comes walking out of the side, sure enough, and I said, oh, hi. I didn't think anybody was here because it was so dark. She said, oh, well, we don't turn them on us. we got patients in here that we're, you know, testing on. I said, all right. I said, well, I'm here to see Dr. Maxfield. And she said, oh, yes, he's expecting you just a minute. He'll be right out from the, the back. So pretty soon he came bursting through the doors and double doors, and he's a green, you know, surgery-type long coat and short hair, cowboy boots, and a big cigar sticking out of his mouth there, and he's a tall fellow. He says to me, look, um, hi, I'm, I'm Jim Maxfield. And I said, oh, I'm Stan Dale. Glad to meet you. I, the guy think I'm supposed to meet you. He said, yeah, you are. Come on in my office and we'll talk. So we get in there and he sits down, puts his boots up on his desk and says, he says, what are you doing? And I said, uh, what do you mean? Like at, at home in my laboratory or at the office or, or what? He said, what you doing in your laboratory? And so I realized by looking around the wall behind him, all these plaques and mathematics and radiation and, and laser research and, you know, the, the guy was way ahead of me in mathematics, and I said, well, um, you know, uh, I've been trying to combine gravitational and, and, and magnetic and electric effects uh, to, uh, to to get a, he says, look, don't stumble around, you're working on anti-gravity, we know that, now tell me what you're doing. So then when he'd used the, the rather plebeian term of, of anti-gravity and not some highfalutin term, I realized that, you know, okay, we can talk, and he knows where I'm at, so... I started telling a bit about my research and how I'd, I'd found out that uh, we could propel craft forward uh, in, in a number of fields, whether it be uh, gravitational, magnetic, or inertial, or whatever. And he said, well, let me show you something. 
and he took me around and walked me around his office walls inside there, and he said, look, here's a picture of me and Dr. Teller going under the pole here in our submarine. This is, you know, to get to the base we've got here, and et cetera, et cetera. And he, everybody gets initiated with this uh, champagne ceremony, and we went on around all this stuff, and he said, no, we've, def- we've overseen about 50 projects uh, since the mid-50s. I mean, he was talking about himself and Dr. Edward Teller to develop um, anti-gravity-type propulsion systems. And uh, yours is just uh, one of the, the, the later attempts to do that. We'd like to have you join our project. So to make a long story short, they sent people out. Uh, I got my clearances. They um, helped me uh, to get things organized in Australia. And uh, I was sent down there with my family um, rather rapidly. And um, my contact in the area in, in Australia, in uh, Victoria, was uh, Sir John Williams, Captain Sir John Williams. Uh, who was knighted by the Queen for recovering a bunch of gold in World War II to help the war effort. And uh, he was also uh, the the overseer of people like myself there in Australia working on uh, the, the Maxfield Teller-type projects. Our local R&D uh, center place there was the Fisherman's Bend Research Lab, the Aeronautical Lab at Fisherman's Bend in Victoria. Um, so I was recruited by them to... to finish my work to write papers, uh, which were immediately classified way high uh, in Australia. Um, you virtually had to be born in the club to, to get a look at them. I found out as time went by, but the reason was that they didn't want certain types or concepts uh, of propulsion to leak out into the public because it would just create more problems like I had become. That's the reason they recruited me more than what I knew is what I might say openly in trying to finance you know, research projects like that. Um, I was I was there in Australia for probably 30 years before I came back. But um, early in the piece, I disagreed with these fellows uh, on a number of issues of what we were keeping hidden from the public as far as technology. The technology you've asked about what was being worked on there was I told you I was working on plasma uh, MHD drives for saucer-shaped craft. There were other people that had already perfected. Um, electrogravitic or anti-gravity uh, coil drive craft. Uh, they perfected the point of getting it to lift off and do things, and there were still a number of other problems they had to solve with time dilation inside the craft for the crew and, and materials on board, but that was that was just an engineering uh, exercise. Uh, they had uh, developed a rather small device by comparison to uh, most uh, prime mover power sources in that they could take thermal energy out of either nuclear decay or, or uh, incident um, infrared radiation or whatever that's uh, in the infrared band and convert that to directly to electricity. Um, that would be basically a thermionic uh, uh, converter, and uh, it was quite efficient and it could power a large craft. Because of the way the craft are, are, are propelled by a field, a containment field that passes through the craft and its crew and then back around the outside. Um, you don't need to have the brute force that most uh, things like the space shuttle uh, have to have to get up into orbit. You can build up your field over a period of minutes, even hours if you wish, but to a field diameter in some of the 30-foot diameter crafts, to a field diameter of about 800 feet. And uh, once you've established that by pumping small amounts of energy uh, in phase, uh, make a harmonic envelope or a, a flux capacitor, if you wish, magnetic flux capacitor, uh, you were able to um, move the craft rather rapidly by just um, bending uh, the field in the direction you wanted to go. Uh, you stored this huge amount of energy, and you could make it do things with just small amounts of energy vectoring it. Sure, sure. So it's almost like a uh, gravitational transistor then, in some ways. Say that again? Oh, a little bit like a gravitational transistor, I guess. A small amount of energy controls a much larger yeah, flow. Yeah, that's, that's a good analogy, exactly. Um, the, I, I, I hated to use the term flux capacitor because I know they use it in the Back to the Future series, but in essence, um, because the field is dynamic, uh, the electron uh, path, uh, or paths uh, in and around the craft in this spiral vortex it forms uh, does make... Uh, what Faraday looked for and described as a flux magnetic flux capacitor. Um, charge capacitors, on the other hand, a charge is stationary. It's defined as Q in physics, and uh, you 
you determine its charge relative to another charge, so you have QQ primed, and, and that's your, your charge uh, relationship. But if you um, take Q charges and move them through time from point A to point B, then you have Q over T with a relationship to Q prime. And as a result, Q over T now gives you a dynamic field whence uh, the flux comes from, uh, or the, the illusion of flux. And that's why a flux capacitor is a dynamic field and not a static one. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, in terms of this technology, you know, one of the questions is about the government. Because, you know, I have no doubts that they've played with these technologies in the past. But it seems like there's been a little bit more resurgence recently, I guess, in trying to reinvestigate them. You know, and at the very least, it looks like they're spending the same money time and time again to reinvent the wheel. But, um, you know, at most, it also seems like a lot of the modern efforts are kind of stalled out. You know, I, I think the real experts have retired or left or, or, you know, just gone to other industries. Well, let me kind of explain that. Um, Teller's group and Maxfield uh, were not just American groups. They were joined with the Russians through uh, Dr. Andrei Sakharov and his group uh, in... in um, the United Kingdom, in Australia, in New Zealand, there were there were people involved in this project of, of many nations, primarily uh, Western nations. But um, they were not governments; they were engineers, physicists, uh, scientists, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, money lenders, uh, big guys, who all formed this consortium to try to, in their words, um, globalize the earth and uh, avert future wars. Uh, when their group uh, fell apart, uh, actually it was taken over in the late 70s by a, a much more powerful group, uh, the government had no knowledge or no detailed knowledge of the research programs and what had, what had been going on the underground bases. Uh, only members of government that were going to be there permanently and not be reelected every four years were, had any chance of even knowing uh, the details inside the project. Um, parts were manufactured and tested by aerospace companies and uh, uh, public monies uh, were spent, you know, through NASA subcontracts, uh, you know, to contractors in the aerospace industry. But no one, uh, it, well, not no one, but very few people within the aerospace contractors knew what was going on in the big picture. They would get instructions to make part A, and they would have input factors like uh, frequencies, power levels, et cetera, et cetera, on one side of the specification, the other side to say output specifications, blah, 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 and generally hardened to these kind of environmental conditions. When you finish developing the part, we'll pay you and we'll have you send it to such and such an address. So everybody's sending parts to other addresses and not realizing it when they put these parts together with other parts that they would get a working flying saucer or a new power source or things that would uh, make doorways appear in solid metal and then, then, then reseal into solid metal again once you walk through. Uh, or plasma cutting beams or things like this. There was a lot of technology that was done this way, and people had no idea they were working on it because they were working on subsystems. Sure. Well, and, you know, you mentioned the term flying saucer, and one of the things that you've indicated is that this may have been a mixture of both ET and human technology. So I, I guess one of the obvious next questions is how difficult it is to integrate these two, uh, especially in terms of propulsion and control systems. Well, the propulsion is one thing. Uh, the control systems is, is totally another. Um, there was strong evidence, that, you know, from what I got inside the group, that the control systems of the downcraft, like the Roswell incident, were uh, neurally interfaced to the uh, occupant or occupants. And uh, as such, these were way ahead of anything we knew or probably know now as far as interfacing the human brain directly to um, control systems. Uh, that, that side, it would be extremely difficult. But um, the propulsion side of it was a little easier to to address because of uh, um, the materials involved. I mean, there there, there are materials, there are there are fields and things that generate the fields. And of course, it wasn't without uh, accident and, and uh, I'm sure death or injury to people testing it along the way. But um, in essence, uh, a number of different ways to propel things came out of studying the, the craft itself. Um, the power system in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the guts of it there that generated the electrons from the, the uh, heat produced by bombarding various things, uh, that, that allows you to produce a lot of electricity quickly and, and do it very efficiently. Uh, basically, that's done through mm, converting heat.
heat uh, tri in the infrared range uh, tribal luminescently to uh, electrons. And then that gives you your, your intense current flow that you can use to direct the coils in the operation of uh, the toroidal uh, craft we're talking about. Uh, there are other things, uh, some, some of them were not propulsion, like the, the uh, thing that made shapes appear and open up in, in solid metal, like a doorway. Um, those were uh, very efficient ways to separate atoms without tearing thousands of them apart, you know, in the width of a cut or something. Uh, so much so that you could put them back together and uh, reapply the frequency pattern to them, and they would uh, re-adhere, re-bond, and it would be a solid metal surface without melting it. Sure. That sounds like something we might be leaning towards with nanotechnology in the next hundred years. Uh, well, certainly certainly soon. Uh, of course, if the United States and other countries don't go to war before then and destroy everything, but... Um, this was the this was the problem that the group had. It was uh, other than the engineering feats and the back engineering and, and uh, combining of technologies, they had the problem of the psychology of what they were doing. Where were they headed uh, as a group? And this is a multinational group. How were they going to unify the planet and and try to avoid the war uh, that we know is coming? And uh, that was their whole objective. Uh, because they, they knew this alien presence that they'd interface with was eventually going to be here in greater numbers, and without a unified planet, we couldn't even hope to, to defend ourselves. Uh, they knew at the time that the ones they were dealing with were not uh, friendly uh, in the long run, and only marginally cooperative because of, of things that we had of theirs they wanted back. So uh, it, it was a difficult task for the guys from the start, uh, a balancing act on a very fall, small you know, tightrope. Oh, absolutely. Well, you've said that spin is a crucial part of the interaction between electromagnetism and gravity. And, you know, this is a common theme. Uh, we see this in a variety of sources. The, the Marcus device is one example. The Searle effect is yet another. Um, even the Nazi Bell device that Nick Cook wrote about uh, utilized spin. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about why that's important and, and a little bit about how gravity really works in your model. All right. Well, it's, um, yeah. The, the the factor of spin is evident in everything we observe uh, in the universe that has a gravitational constant or value. Uh, atoms have uh, gravity between each other, but they're, they're, they're a weak force. Our gravity on our planet is a weak force by comparison to electro electrostatic or um, magnetic forces. Hence, it's called the weak force. But... Um, models that were built, you know, mathematical models probably, oh, I'd say in the uh, mid-60s, started to um, to bend toward what's called a hydrodynamic model of the unified field theory. Uh, the majority of the, the classified ones went that way. It's not an easy way to go because they had to start working with um, fluid motions, dynamics of fluids and Venturi effects and Bernoulli effects and to describe uh, the, the major forces that have been observed at a uh, microscopic and macroscopic level in the universe. So, when they started looking at atoms this way, they realized that the atom, uh, from Heisenberg's analysis of it, that the atom had uh, electrons that you could not actually detect their location. They, there was an uncertainty principle uh, as to where they were. If you could detect them by bouncing radiation or uh, a wavelength off of them, they wouldn't be there uh, when your message got back to you, so you couldn't actually determine where they were. Then they started to say, well, it's, it's an electron cloud. It's everywhere at once. Um, then they got to realize, well, it's actually a spin. Uh, in, the, in the early days of microwave, they realized the nucleus of the atom has a spin component uh, equivalent in frequency at about 40 gigahertz, and the uh, electron shell is somewhere around 10 gigahertz, and all spin. Now, when you look... At the, at the overview of gravity, um, it, is, it is somewhat like I explained in the Cosmic Conspiracy book. A simple linear look at, at, a, at a gravitational force here on the Earth would be, let's take a, a, a little railway uh, track, uh, say about oh, 15, 20 feet long, inside of a, of, a, of a building with a flat wall at the end of the track. And we're going to put a small um, platform on that track with... Uh, uh, small train wheels, so that you can push that, that little cart on its train wheels right up flat, snug against the wall of your factory there, your lab. 
right where the cart touches the wall, you're going to mount a wooden um, end, you know, upright uh, end on the cart itself so that it's got like an L shape if you look at it from the side. Now you pull the cart back 20 feet from the wall and you stand facing the cart and the wall and you turn on, say, a fire hose full of water and you, and you shoot it onto this upright panel attached to the end of the cart. Well, the cart is going to race all the way back to the wall, flat up against the wall, isn't it? Sure, absolutely. Okay, all right. Now let's pull that cart back, and let's drill a bunch of holes in that upright so that it's like Swiss cheese. Now we shoot our fire hose at it again to push it up against the wall. Now what happens, Tim? Well, um, offhand, I, I'm not entirely sure. All right, I'll tell you. Some of the water gets through the holes and hits the wall of the lab before the cart gets there. That reflecting water now forms a cushion so that the the little cart can't get snug up against the wall. It can't fit flat anymore. So while the water hose is running, or the fire hose, and the cart is standing off of the wall maybe two or three inches because of the water that gets through the holes in its, its structure and bounces off, we now go over to the cart and we take it with our hand and we force it back toward the fire hose and we let go of it. It'll bounce backwards toward the wall and oscillate for a bit until it stabilizes still a few inches off of the wall. If we force it with our hand as close to the wall as we can and let go of it, it will bounce off the wall back to that neutral point. Sure, it's sure. It's got two forces acting on it. The primary force coming from the hose and the reflected force coming from the wall, from the water that got through the holes. Now, the holes are somewhat like the spaces between molecules. If you have a spinning uh, ball in a fluid like oil, and you spin that ball maybe 20,000 RPM, maybe, well, even faster, but at 20,000 RPM, it will start to develop little ripple rings around the ball and out to the edge of your container. Now, you can visualize that, can't you? Oh, absolutely. All right. What the Japanese found about 25 years ago when they were trying this very experiment was if they varied the spin rate of that little ball submerged in the oil, that these uh, rings of waves, uh, which formed out in a, in a progression out uh, of radii out from the, the center of the ball, these rings started to change their respective radii and to collide with each other and to disappear, annihilate, and then to add to each other depending on what speed you were spinning the ball. So they realized we are looking at two kinds of waves here. The waves that diverge outward from the spinning ball and the waves that, di that converge at reflecting back from the oil and the container that contains the oil. Now, in a very high-speed spin, uh, in a dense space, space itself forms um, a sort of soft cushioned wall like the container for that oil. Take the earth now. We spin the earth in this imaginary fluid. Waves, shock waves go out and then shock waves reflect back in. And the sum of those two wave series, divergent and convergent, form orbital null rings around the earth. One of them, of course, in this case, being where the moon orbits. Now, the gravitational force that the Earth exerts is the sum of its divergent waves and its convergent waves. So it is a weak force when you compare the net difference where we are on the surface of the Earth. But the actual force in the divergent or convergent wave is huge by comparison. This is the mystery that has been facing the, the guys trying to analyze gravity uh, you know, for hundreds of years, is they did not realize that it was a net vector of two sums, or, or two series, divergent convergent waves, in a spin motion around the Earth, created, or creating the Earth, or holding it in space, if you wish, um, which brings up another issue, which I, I probably should explain at this point. Uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment uh, that people think uh, defined uh, the speed of light as a, an absolute limit was in error at the first time they did it. And what their test did, without going over the details of that, I'm sure that most of your uh, readers or listeners would know about the Michelson-Morley linear experiment, was they shot light in the path of the Earth as it went around the sun and went at right angles to the path, and if they returned back out of phase, it would mean that they had detected an ether space which created drag 
light on the light wave as the Earth moved through space around the sun. Sure. They did not, they did not find evidence of that at all. But their test results were inconclusive uh, in the linear example because of this. Imagine a, a, a cup of tea, you know, with, with a bit of cream in it so that you can see what's happening. A few tea leaves are let loose in your stirred cup of tea so that the center of the tea that's spinning, the vortex, becomes the sun, and the little tea leaves that are floating out there and orbiting around it at a slower speed are planets. Now, if you get down on one of those leaves, imagine yourself sitting on the leaf like a little, you know, mite of some sort, and you're looking off to the side of the leaf, are you going to see the tea rushing past you, or are you going to see the tea at the same speed you are doing nothing just because you're going with the tea? What are you going to see? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? You're on the tea leaf. It is moving around the, the cup because you've, you've stirred it. When you look right on the edge of the tea leaf where you are, is the tea going to be moving faster than the tea leaf or at the same speed? Uh, at the same speed. Okay, if it's now moving at the same speed, and you shoot a light wave in the direction of your travel and one out to the right and back on the surface of the tea leaf, you're going to get no difference in velocity, aren't you? So really what you're saying is the ether is being dragged with the Earth, and therefore... No, 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 no. I'm saying the ether is making the Earth move. The Earth is trapped in an orbit created by the spin in the ether space. Oh, okay, okay. I know they've tried to get that, that dragged ether blanket thing put forward, but it's not that. Everything at a nuclear level seems to be uh, exhibited at a macroscopic level in a cosmological analysis of the universe. Um, uh, the planets that orbit our sun, for instance, there is recent historical evidence that maybe Venus was an interloper and came in and jumped orbits and took uh, its position where it is today, and that Electra, the planet between Mars and Jupiter, was originally there but broke up. And this, I mean, NASA talks about this in the back room, although they won't speak about it publicly, but they are pretty certain it was a planet. Sure. My own sure. research in that has shown that the surface of Mars is covered with red dust and portions of a 600-mile diameter um, uh, moon of that planet Electra that crashed into the surface of Mars after the, the, the Electra planet broke up. Well, why did it break up? If you look at um, Saturn, for instance, with its, its rings, the rings are changing uh, distances. There's just hundreds of little rings, and they're changing their spacings between them. As Saturn ages and slows down and loses energy, the radius of all the the radii of all these rings start cha to, to change because they're formed by these divergent and convergent waves coming back to Saturn. Same as with Jupiter, which now has uh, solid moons instead of rings. And it would have had rings instead of moons if something hadn't come along and crashed into Jupiter a long time ago, crashing through these orbital gas rings and making them form uh, local vortices in, in each ring, which became moons. Well, now, to put this theory to the test, you have two experiments that you've come forward with. The first was a description that, well, you actually sent me an email a few minutes ago, and I will publish that on the web, showing some schematics for a coil. And and the second was actually a device you described to me that bends light. Are, are these one and the same, or are they two separate experiments? Um... No, the, the, the coils will bend light, that's true. Oh, okay. So they'll bend electromagnetic radiation, which, you know, visible light is a portion of. Well, you know, one, one of the big, um, you know, one of the big, I, I guess, questions that I receive over and over from my audience is, can you put things up online that we can build? And in this case, this is something that you've offered to put forward that my audience can actually run with and construct on their own to test these theories. Yeah, well, I'm part of a group, uh, I'm sure you know Jean-Louis Nadine's, uh, uh, board or, or bulletin board. Oh, absolutely. About yeah, the, the JLN Labs um, message yep. board on Yahoo Groups. Yep. Well, we put these things here, and I've, I've uh, known uh, or corresponded with uh, Jean-Louis for some time and uh, have explained uh, these things to him uh, in more detail, perhaps, than I have uh, you know, publicly. But that is so that he can build and test um, the first part of it, because cause there are other people now building um, toroidal coils that they put in, in proximity to each other but they weren't doing it quite right, and they were only getting small amounts of gravitational distortion, which would move things like, like paper, which have no electromagnetic component to speak of. Um, as, as yet, I have not sat down and, and made a, a one for public disclosure um, about this. I have mixed opinions as to how much of this to, to, to put out to the public at this point, uh, because you can create fireballs with this that they're not even aware of until the thing, um, until you lose control. 
control of the field you're generating and it starts waltzing through walls. It's like building ball, ball lightning without seeing it until it, it suddenly appears. Sure, sure. So it could be um, a little bit dangerous, but... but well, um, it is, but I prefer to certainly to uh, correspond with the people doing that directly, uh, looking at their skill level uh, in, in the field and, you know, try to try to suss the reason they want to do it anyway, but... Um, it's just that I feel somewhat responsible uh, for that that uh, application of it. I've talked at length um, uh, over the year a number of times, and in my books about the um, pulse toroidal coils, uh, which will produce something like a, a spinning soliton or like a Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, uh, becoming like a super atom in essence, uh, for people to experiment with. Um, and I. I think the coils that I've shown you are like the, the flat wire coils. <laughs> People that have the ability to pulse those coils uh, to match the frequency necessary so that coil, so that one coil uh, co-wrapped over the other coil will be mm, out of phase with the, or in phase with the other one when it's just starting to release and let its back EMF go into the uh, core um, inductor. That they can they can bounce that uh, back EMF into the direction of the other coil as an extra amount of energy is pushed into it. That is the the type of thing that will bend magnetic fields and electromagnetic uh, light. Uh, but even at that level, you should be fairly cautious with it. Now, does this look like a shadow while it's in operation? Um, you know, we've heard rumors of of a kind of a black fog that surrounds the Marcus device. I'm wondering if this might look a little bit similar to that. Well, what I saw, uh, and I and I burned out my coil when I tried it. Another guy down in Australia went down there, and he did the same thing. But um, it's like if you look at the center of the coil, where which is where I was looking, it was like the light from all the things in the room around me were painted onto uh, cellophane or like saran wrap, and they. It was as though the saran wrap was tugged toward the center of the coil, and the light bent toward the center. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. So you actually had a pretty good divergence then from the field. Well, something, yes. It was, it, it produced nausea. I, I certainly nearly lost my breakfast when it happened, but uh, fortunately the coil burned out and that was it. But uh, years past, I, I learned uh, better ways to do that. And now that we have uh, certain semiconductor technologies, which the Muller, the Muller free energy device uses the same concept in some of its... Um, switching uh, circuits uh, up in Canada, you know the Muller motor? Oh, sure, sure. Okay. Um, so with this properly done, I am reasonably certain from, from studying Muller's uh, device that using something similar to his, his uh, pulsing circuit, his switching circuit, you can turn these coils rather than into just anti-gravity, you can turn them into gravitational converters that make electricity out of the gravitational field because it is a dynamic field. It's not static. Absolutely. It has frequency. And uh, that, I think that would be a noble pursuit rather rapidly. Well, you know, it's certainly an excellent kind of beginner's project to get involved with, is building the coil and learning how to pulse it at a semi-resonance mode, I guess. Yeah, I need to write, write this out, I suppose, someday here soon. I, I, I just haven't had time to do a new book or to explain how to do that. But um, there are a lot uh, more clever young engineers out there, electrical engineers, that could probably solve the problem uh, simpler than I could if I tell them the theory and, and don't, don't spoil them with my, my antiquated ways of doing circuits, but say, look, here's the theory, and here's what you, you know, the steps you have to do. You have to create this circuit, that circuit, that circuit to accomplish this. And uh, that way, then they're, they're free to, uh, to proceed at their own speed and uh, in the direction they feel best that would solve it. A absolutely. Well, what I'll do in the short term is I will definitely put your material up online, and then people can get a closer look at the coils that you've designed and the, the schematics that you've drawn. And then hopefully we can put in a little bit of text saying, you know, how people should set up the coil apparatus in terms of power and pulsing. Um, you know, and, and so that's, that's one resource that they can look at online. Now the other resource is your website. Uh, your website online is at www.standeo.com, and that's S-T-A-N-D-E-Y-O.com. It's a comprehensive website, and I'm going to put up a link from American Anti-Gravity to that as well. And can you tell us a little bit about the books that you've written online? Well, they 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 are online for sale. They're not written as online books, but uh, we do have some uh, description of what's in the books there. The Cosmic Conspiracy was my first book, and um, it uh, was divided.
divided into three parts, the uh, plus appendices. And the appendices are not for the faint-hearted. They are, they are uh, there to prove uh, the state of research and development from known sources at the time I first drafted the book in 1978. Um, the book does discuss uh, part of my involvement or how I got involved in the, in the, uh, uh, the technology and, and, and the cover-up group. It shows a photocopy of a, of a letter I got from Dr. Maxfield on behalf of himself, Dr. Teller, and uh, mentioning my contact, Sir John Williams. In fact, on the website, there's a picture of Sir John Williams. And, in, um, oh, if you go to visit Stan's World or uh, something like that, I forget what we call it, but it's on the, there's a little button on the front page that says uh, go to, uh, you know, uh, Stan's place, which is my part of the website. Uh, Holly does the majority of the website now, and I just I do Stan's corner of the universe, which is is there. And you'll find there a link to Sir John Williams <clears throat> and a bit about him. And um, you can see the face of some of these people, uh, you know, like uh, Teller and Sakharov, and uh, that will help a bit. But anyway, the the book, The Cosmic Conspiracy, uh, covers that and the the conspiracy, if you will, between the illuminated minds of the world at the time who were above governments, in essence. Um, and then I look at uh, some of the uh, technologies that were held back from Tesla. I explain some of the work of Dr. John Trump at MIT, uh, whom, whom I did meet with before he died in Boston. And Dr. Trump, Trump was the guy that um, was asked by the FBI to um, look over... Uh, a device that Tesla left in the New Yorker Hotel, which is uh, said to be the ultimate um, uh, weapon, you know, a super weapon, and the FBI was afraid to open it without somebody of knowledge, and so they had John Trump do it. So, uh, although I don't cover this particular tale in the book, I I know that uh, from what John told me that he uh, opened the package that Tesla left as surety against uh, what he owed the hotel uh, for his room for several years, and uh, it was in a brown paper bag, and it was a finely polished. Um, decade resistance box, uh, you know, with brass on it, and it had the three known resistances and the unknown one, and everybody thought, well, gee, it's just a decade resistance box. But in te Tesla's enigmatic way, what he had done was left the formula right in front of them for the secret to everything, and that was to balance energy exchanges, to, to bring them into harmony. And once you do that, whether it be with a, uh, a Tesla coil or whether it be with a uh, vibrating rock you can do wonderful things and move things and convert things using frequency in phase between two masses. Sure. sure. Anyway, that's that's uh, that's an aside. John Trump did uh, uh, say about his own research in the book that he uh, uh, he had uh, done an experiment with two plates, two 12-inch uh, square plates in a in a vacuum, and he was testing the capacitance of each of them, and he found that if he had a a uh, gradient of 300 volts per centimeter between the two plates that he would get um, uh, 0.0057, you know, like about 57 ten thousandths of a pound of force of attraction between the plates. But if he jumped the voltage from 300 to 30,000 volts per centimeter, he got 0.57, or a thousand times the, uh, the, the force. So then he jumped it again a hundred times again to three million volts per centimeter, which is as high as they could get in those days. And to his surprise, it jumped from 0 0.57 to 5,750 pounds of force between these two plates. In other Why words, it, it was an exponential increase in force then. Exactly, exactly. Now imagine if you have these two plates in that vacuum and they are a standoff there with this much force between them and you move one plate closer to or further away from the other plate, will the voltage between those two plates change? Uh, no, no, not that I know of. Well, you're going to you're going to charge your crowds, so your your field density will change, and in, in essence, so will your voltage level on those plates, because if the QQ relationship at a distance, QQ over S, is a function of the distance between the two plates or the two charges. So if you increase the distance, the QQ will uh, decrease. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, the overall okay. charge too. Now okay. the reason I, I drag you into that uh, in the book is this. Tesla was playing with a way to interface between two charged plates, the upper atmosphere and the surface of the Earth. That's what he called the solar capacitor. And he was playing with that movement of the outer charged envelope of the atmosphere from the solar wind in reference to the Earth. And that's described in the book and also in the Vindicator Scrolls book. Now, the Vindicator Scrolls book, which is the second book I wrote, uh, is a collection.
collection of a number of things. Certainly about a third of it is uh, technology and discussion of what we're talking about here, plus more on the Deo effect where you, uh, in a direct current pulse wire, you have a torque that develops momentarily until it, it um, equalizes, and this causes a twist in the wire, and that's what John louis has in his website, uh, my paper on that. And then uh, I talked about making uh, motors that uh, have no wire, uh, no, no, no coils, no magnets. They, they run simply on the Deo torque effect. Um, I, in the process of my studies in ancient languages and, and, and technologies, I ran across uh, a way to, to locate the, the mythical Garden of Eden uh, in a real place today, and the garden, or sorry, and the, and the location of Atlantis um, the same way, and uh, took a dive off into exploring that in, in the first half of the book to uh, explain to people where they are today and, and why they were so hard to find. Absolutely. Well, that's, unfortunately, that's the subject for another interview because we're out of time for today. Okay. But... I do want to thank you, uh, absolutely thank you, for your time, as well as for the project for people to work on and the description of your work. So, Look, uh, Tim, I, I thank you for that. I will try to get some things, uh, some thoughts together. If I get some experiments together, I'll, 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 I'll propose that. Okay. Well, thanks again. And uh, again, your website is www.standeo.com.